morning. We're going to Jeremiah 29. You can open your Bibles to there. As you're looking, I grew up here. I grew up in Castlegar. I loved it growing up. I wasn't one of those teenagers that um, couldn't wait to graduate and leave and disappear because Castlegar had nothing for you. I actually loved being here. I grew up loving being in the mountains and I rock climbed and being on rocks and I loved it here. We had four different homes growing up. Uh, we seem to move every five years. I'm not really sure why, but it seems like clockwork. Every five years, my dad would decide, we're moving. It's like, great, we're moving. And always in Castigar, but <clears throat> always to a new place, which brought excitement. But Castigar was my home. It was home to me. And then you leave, and you go away, and I gr went to the island and went to school. And then I ended up in Manitoba and thought, what the heck is this place? And... <laughs> <clears throat> it's a, not the promised land. Um, I shouldn't say that. It might be the promised land for certain people. It was not my promised land. Um, went there, but then I got to know the people, and we were helping church plant, and we got to know uh, the people we were church planting with, and we ran a country youth group, and we had 30 teenagers around, and I loved them, and it was home. Right? It was home, and I, didn't, I was okay being there, and then James decided we're going back to BC. I was, um, had had Paige and wasn't in university anymore, and so we're like, we're going back. And it came back to Castigar with this vision of it being home and it feeling a certain way, and you get back and, and you learn really quickly it wasn't what I remembered it to be. Not because the scenery had changed and not really because even all the people had changed, but I had changed. I wasn't the same. And so now I was back trying to make a home in what was my home once, but as a different person. <clears throat> and eventually we made it home. Home, it has this notion of belonging. It has this space where you are bought into you know what I mean? If you think about that, and some people grow up in the same house their whole entire life, and to think of that changing is very overwhelming. I didn't. I grew up in different houses, and home was my family. And there was a lot of them, and they were around a lot. And uh, some of them in the audience are laughing. It's just that was home, right? Home was every birthday with 30 people, and every Christmas with 30 people, and <clears throat> everyone knowing, I won't say what Dave calls it, but everyone knowing everything. <laughs> right, Dave? Um, that was home, and now you come back and you're reestablishing what home is. But home has this notion of a place of belonging, a place where you are settled, a place where you are giving and where you're invested, a place where you have roots. We're going into Jeremiah this morning, and we're talking about Israel, part of Israel, not all of Israel, but part of Israel had been exiled to this place of Babylon. They had been taken from the place of where they found home, and they were placed into a new space, this place called Babylon. <clears throat> they had been through a lot as a nation, right? They had, this isn't the first time where they had been in situations they didn't want to be and God had uh, brought them out of Egypt and he had tried to bring them into the promised land and their faith caused them to prolong that for 40 years and they wandered in the desert and then they ended up in their promised land and they had a home, they had a place to belong. And now all of a sudden, they're in this space again where they're like, we have to start over again. We have to make a home. And I think a lot of them probably felt this heart posture of this will change again too. Let's just buy our time. Let's just wait until we get to go back to our promised land. See, because Babylon wasn't a very great place to be. If you were an Israelite that believed in Jehovah, that wanted to serve Jehovah, their God, how do we know that? Well, we all know the stories of Radshak and Benny, 
Anyone watch Veggie Tales here? Yes, right? Brad Shack and Benny and how they were there and they were working and were kind of forced to, to bow down to idol, this idol of the king, King Nebuchadnezzar, and they had to make a choice not to do it. So obviously we got this king who thinks he's pretty great, probably runs his nation the same way, thinking that I know what's best and I'm going to make everyone do what's best and they need to obey me. So we know Babylon isn't this amazing paradise to be living in as a believer of God. And that's where we pick up where we're going this morning. Jeremiah was a prophet, and God would speak to him, and he would speak to uh, the people and say, this is what God has to say to you. So Jeremiah 29 Verse 4, God speaks to his people through Jeremiah, and he says this. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there. Do not decrease. Also, seek the peace and the prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. God, as we look into your word this morning and we look into what you have for us in your word this morning, I pray that our hearts would be ready and open to hear from you. God, I pray that you would take any words out of my mouth that are not from you and anything that you have to speak will be spoken. In your name, amen. See, these people had been moved and they could make a choice. And I think it's a lot of choice that we end up in, either figuratively or actually in reality, where we are living somewhere where we know isn't our paradise. We know it isn't our promised land. We know it might not be where God wants us one day, but we are placed somewhere for a season And I believe we're faced with the same choice, sometimes spiritually, where we know that we're in this season of being in Babylon where a lot of things seem to not be all that great, but but God has placed you there. And we have this choice to make, just like they had a choice to make. What are you going to do in that season, in the place that God has placed you? See, it's very interesting because it starts off in verse 4 by saying this. To all those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. See, God put them there. He wasn't shocked by them being in this space that was hard on them, having to rebuild, having to uh, figure out what faith looked like. He wasn't shocked by any of that. He actually said, I put you there. You're not there by accident. I put you there. Sometimes God places us in Babylon. We may not understand it, and we may not know why, because we know, God, but you've, you've told me, you've prophesied, you've showed me what the promised land is supposed to look like. So I know where I will be one day, but I'm not there yet. So why am I here? So the first thing we need to realize is that God sometimes puts you in Babylon. And he has something for you, more than just to buy your time until you get to the promised land. And this is what he says. Build houses, settle down, plant gardens, and eat what they produce. What is he saying? Make a home. Dig in. Put roots in. 
Because it doesn't matter whether or not you're there for a year or two years or five years. I've put you there. And you are to be planted where you are. He says, don't go dormant. Don't go into hibernation waiting for spring and summer. There are animals that are cold-blooded, and what do they do when it gets too cold? You think they're actually dead. I teach a student, and we're going through this unit right now, and you understand cold-blooded animals, when the temperature drops really drastically, they kind of, everything slows down, and they just kind of go into this space where if you, if you picked it up and you held it, you would think it was dead unless it started warming back up. See, but God hasn't made us cold-blooded animals. He's made us warm-blooded. What does that mean? That means that we're adaptable to the environment that we're placed in. We have the ability to keep on living even in the winter. It's a good thing this year, isn't it? Hey, but we went back for Christmas in Manitoba, and I promise you it has given me a new outlook on our winter. I have not complained. <laughs> Very little. Less than usual. Is that better? I have complained less than usual. <laughs> See, God says, be productive. Put roots down. Build gardens. Build a home. I know this isn't where you necessarily want to be. And I won't get into the backstory of why they were there. They were really there by their own doing. Sometimes we are in our Babylon by our own doing, sometimes it's not. But the reality is this is a space they were in and there was a lot of things that they would have changed, but they couldn't change it. So God said, no, be productive. Don't go dormant. Dig in, build gardens, thrive. See, because God wants us to grow where we are planted. There's certain trees that need very specific conditions. When we were down in Palm Springs, I don't remember what they're called. Do you remember what they're called? Those trees that only like grow in that one little area? No, not the orange trees you stole from. Um, <laughs> Joshua trees, that's what they're called. There's these trees. Thanks, Josh. Good thing you remembered it. Joshua trees. So there's these trees, and as you're driving through Palm Springs, there's like this space where you go up, and the elevation is just right. And the temperature is just right. And there's this space where these trees grow that are called Joshua trees. It's the only place they grow. And in that space, they're lush and they're beautiful trees. But you won't see them outside of that space because they can't grow outside of that space. And then you see our pine trees that are on the sides of rocks. And you think, how the heck is that growing off a rock? See, God has made us more like pine trees than he's made us like Joshua trees. We are to grow no matter what the soil is, no matter what the environment is, no matter what the elevation is. He says, be productive and grow. God wants you to make a life where you're at. Not wait to make a life until you get to where you want to be. God wants you to make a life where you're at, not where you want to be. Not that it's bad to have dreams and vision for where you want to be one day, but he's telling them, he's saying, have kids. Don't look outside and be so scared by what's going on around you and say, how can we bring kids into this world and have them have to make a choice of, am I going to choose to go into the fire like Radshat and Benny, or am I going to choose to bow down to a king that wants me to serve him? He says, have kids, even though it might seem scary out there. I'm asking you to keep on growing. Don't let yourself decrease. Saying don't let yourself go backwards when you're in Babylon. You following me this morning? See, God wants us to thrive and be planted and grow where we're at. Not wait until we get to where we think we want to be. Because you'll never get to where you want to be. If you don't grow 
where you're planted. Often the visions and the dreams and the plans that God has for you that sometimes we hold on to. The plans that he had for Israel, the reason they were in Babylon was to learn a very valuable lesson so he could bring them back to where he wanted them to be. But if they didn't learn how to be thankful, how to thrive, how to dig in, how to get over themselves, because sometimes they got a little too prideful and thought, you know what, we just deserve what God has for us. I shouldn't have to do anything for it. And sometimes he's reminding them and saying, no, you will be thankful even in Babylon. There's a very interesting, interesting place that he goes after he says, hey, build a life. Which, you know what, I probably got most people on board now, right? Yes, we are to build a life. We are to have kids. We are to thrive in our little Christian bubble. We are to stay away from anything that might hurt us or hurt our kids or cause any kind of disruption in our nice Christian bubble that seems to be protected. But here's where he goes with this. He says, Seek peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. You know what he says? He says, you love where I've planted you. You don't speak negatively against it, because you speak negatively against where I've planted you. You're speaking against yourself. He's saying, you be tied to the place that I have planted you because I have planted you there. And if they prosper, you prosper. He says, let your heart see them how I see them. The original text actually says, seek out their welfare. So that you can receive your welfare. Do you want them to be well? Do you want them to be prosper? Because sometimes we can say, yes, I am here and I am planted, but I'm going to protect myself against my Babylon. But even Rad Shat and Benny, they went and they had jobs. They were in the community. They were in the place that they were planted. That's why they were forced to make the choice that they were making. The only reason why they got put in a position to have to exercise their faith in the way that they had to exercise their faith. And then they had to be thrown into a fire for exercising that faith. And now all of these people got to see God's glory being shone. That everything got pointed back to him was because they made a choice to be in the world to be in their city, to be in the places that were uncomfortable. God says, go and desire prosperity. Stop nitpicking about all the things that may be wrong and all the decisions that could be wrong. All the direction that the world is going that it shouldn't be going. And I agree with you on a lot of those things. But he says, get on your knees and pray that they would prosper, that there would be peace. Get out there and show them how to prosper. Because you know what happens when now all of a sudden you're in the space? For me, my context is my kids and their friends, and their friends' parents. And now all of a sudden, I have relationships with my friends' parents. And now I have friends' parents that come to me for advice on how to parent their kids. Now I have a space to go in and speak life into families that now get to be a part of my kids' life. So yes, if I can help them be better parents and understand the love of Christ, that affects how they raise their children. And if that affects how they raise their children, that prospers my family. Do you get what I'm saying? God says when you get out there and you make your city healthier, 
in turn, you will be healthier. You will be healthier. We're going to turn to Luke chapter 19. If you think that this is easy to do, or not sure that we can do it, I want to look at the life of Christ just for a second. See if anyone had the right to be angry or to isolate himself or keep himself away from the world, it was Christ, knowing what they were going to do to him. And if we're supposed to follow his example, I want to show you what he did. So Christ in this, Jesus in this, in this uh, passage, he's coming into Jerusalem. Okay, He's looking over Jerusalem as he comes in. And what he sees and what he knows is that these people will kill him. These people will not understand God's plan and the purpose for God's plan for them, they will be, they will in turn kill him. You following me? That wasn't all that clear. I'm sorry. Jesus is coming in to Jerusalem. Start over. Rewind. Uh, Jesus is coming in to Jerusalem. He's there. He's overlooking the city. It is his city. It is his people. But he also knows that they're not going to understand what God has for them. He gets that, that they are lost, and he's overlooking them. He could have been very bitter and angry in that moment, which we see him do at some time. He actually curses a fig tree for not producing figs, right, when he was mad at it because he was hungry and wanted figs, and it wasn't giving him food, and so he said, die. You know, he, he, he could have looked at the city and said, I'm mad at you. You're not going to actually accept me. I am going to go and do what God's asked me to do, but I'm not going to be doing it with a very loving heart because I am frustrated that you don't get it. But this is his response as he walks into Jerusalem and he overlooks it. Verse 41, he says this, simple verse, and he approached Jerusalem and saw the city and he wept over it. He looked at the city and the people that were going to hang him on a cross, that were going to totally reject him and his father. And his heart was not one of anger. His heart was one of weeping. The word there actually means to wail, to sob out loud. I see this picture of Jesus falling and crying out with such passion because his heart was broken that people weren't going to grasp what God had for them. See, God wants us to have that heart for Kassigar. I don't know how long all of you are planted here for. I don't know how long you will fight find Kassigar home for. Some of you, for the rest of your lives. Some of you, it's just for a season. But God wants our hearts to be broken in such a way that we desire Kassigar to prosper. That we desire to say we are willing to put ourselves out there to the place where we may have to make a choice of whether or not we go in the fire or we compromise our faith. I'm not saying those choices won't come when you put yourself out there. But what he is saying is, I want your heart to be so broken for your city and what I have for it that you're willing to step out, to dig in, to plant, and to serve your community. Because you know what happens when the church rises up, and now all of a sudden, instead of when we moved here, I think there was one police officer that was a Christian, and he left. <laughs> Very soon after we got here. But you know what happens when that shifts to, what are we at now? Eight? I don't know, somewhere around there. 
five for sure. At least five. When you've got five that now have an outlook of people's hearts and what God's plan is for them when they are interacting with them in that capacity, lives get changed. You know what happens when you've got those that are putting their lives on the line, like the fire hall, having someone else step into their space? James won't say this himself, but I get to hear it all the time. The life and the light that he gets to bring into horrific situations for being there. And people's lives get changed. You know, it happens when those that have the ability to understand boards and decision makings go and end up on city council or end up on boards that divvy out funds for community. The community prospers, but so does the church. Which in turn allows the church to be a better servant of the community which in turn allows the church to prosper. Because now people know Christ. And isn't that what it's all about? Amen? I don't know this morning. I'm going to call the worship team up. We believe in prayer here, and we will pray for those that have needs this morning. And we will worship But as you worship and you pray this morning, I don't know what your Babylon looks like. I don't know whether or not you love being here, whether or not you are totally bought in. I am now. I love my community. I love Castigar. We are planted. And not because I grew up here. There's actually many years after we came back where I looked at James and I was like, I don't know why the heck we're back here. And then I'd go hiking and I'd remember, oh, yes, this is why we're here. But I'm just being honest, there was many years where it was a really difficult transition to figure out how to be who I was and come back into a space where everyone thought they knew who I was and figure that balance out. But I am bought in because I believe that God has a big plan for Castigar. Amen? I believe that, because I've seen it happen on small scales, that when a ch- the church, not new life, not any other church in town, but the church that believes that God is the God who he says he is, when it raises up and it starts acting like the church and it goes up and says, I want my community to prosper because that's what God wants for it, that people will take notice and God will get the glory. Amen? Because I don't know how old and young all of you are, but God is not done with any of you yet. Why? Because people still don't know Christ. Because there's many people in the old folks' home that may only have a couple months and they don't know Christ. Because there's many people in the preschool and they have their whole lives ahead of them and they don't know Christ. So as you go from here, if your heart is one of waiting, where you're like, I'm a little bit dormant because I'm not really happy with either my spiritual well-being right now or I'm not really happy with even the community that I'm placed in, This morning, I believe that God wants to shift that in you. That he wants you to look over your city and weep. That he wants you to see his heart for them. Because his heart for them is that they would understand their identity and how much they're loved. But that causes the church to have to dig in and say, I am willing to plant roots for however long I'm here. And know that when I need to be transplanted, God is big enough with a big enough pot for however big my roots are. God, I thank you for your word this morning. I thank you that you have a plan for Castigar to prosper, that you have a plan for your church to prosper. God, I pray that anything in our hearts that may have isolated us from them, anything in our hearts that have put us in a place of dormancy, that we've decided that we're just going to stay here until things seem to warm up a little bit. God, I pray that you would bring a new fire in, that our hearts would be broken to the place where we want to dig in. God, that we will look 
on our city as Jesus looked on Jerusalem and we will weep and say we're willing to put down our lives for people to know you. We're willing to do whatever it takes. In your precious name, amen.